This is Florida Natural Farming at Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm. I want to talk about uh, farm tools that I use here. So I don't think I've ever talked about it. I want to talk a little bit about the organic certifying processes and agencies because there's like so many. There's biodynamic, there's organic, there's real organic project. Uh, non-GMO, I mean, there's just so many different things that you could do, but it can all get a bit overwhelming, which is the case with me. It got a little bit overwhelming because we're biodynamic, national organic project, um, organic certified, and real organic project certified. Well, the real organic project certified people didn't show up for their inspection. So that's like a big red flag for me. Um, when people don't show up, it's kind of a trigger for me. So I'm not going to do that one. And the organic certifiers, they're just too much into not really being organic anymore. They're into corporate, uh, farmers and they don't really do a lot of the, they don't, uphold the things that I value in, about organic, like uh, animals and um, the number of animals and uh, how they're raised and hydroponics and stuff like that. So I just don't align with what they, the direction they've gone in. Only 1% of the U.S. budget for research and development and agriculture goes towards organic. Well, that's why it doesn't grow. It's really uh, frustrating that the chemical companies are so powerful. Biodynamic, I believe what they do. They, they make you make your own compost and uh, they make you figure out how much nitrogen you're applying and they make you have wild areas. And I was watching a video on um, wild areas of your farm. I was watching a video by the Real Organic Project because I'm like, let me see what they've done lately on YouTube. And it was like, why isn't, why aren't there be becoming more organic farms? They were talking about certified. This little rose is uh, getting ready to bloom like crazy. This Kriposkill rose, tea root, tea, climbing tea rose. Uh, it's quite a stunning rose, I can't wait. So they wanted to know why so many farms didn't growing in this, um, this tea rose is growing in this uh, variegated cassava. It looks stunning, I love it. Um, so many organic farms, or why aren't more people doing organic farms? Because you don't, don't show up for your certification. You make the appointments and then you don't show up. That's why I'm not doing one of them. And then, the organic one, it's just, they don't align. So I got tools that I use. I use different tools. These are about all of the tools I use. So I use this electric chainsaw, um, battery operated, and I use olive oil, organic olive oil, instead of motor oil. And I use the organic olive oil for this wooden bowl that I use to collect fruit. I collect fruit in wooden bowls and I clean it with organic olive oil and organic lemon juice. My dad was a Norwegian marine uh, fine woodworker. So he taught me how to take care of wood. I clean my blade and my machete with the olive oil. I use this shovel with a wooden handle uh, so it doesn't bend as easily. And I used to use this a lot, but it was good when I was younger, but being uh, 60 now, I get tired in the heat of the day. So I got this little handheld chainsaw and I wasn't sure about it um, from Amazon. It was cheap and it came with two batteries. It says to, if it stops charging, 
if it's the time it takes to between charges is shorter and shorter than to uh, stop using. So um, you got to be careful where you put your hands with this. That's one thing. But I've always used chainsaws, so it works. And I didn't get tired, which is a big thing. So it's just one hand, and you just do that. Cut the stuff. It's nice. I like it. I approve. So we grow everything, all our house plants and stuff, and every, everything in pots is grown in our biodynamic compost that we make. This is that uh, tree kale, tree collards, I guess. And all these house plants, biodynamic compost. So I was watching this video, and they're talking about their, you know, their their farm system, they had like a, a bunch of farms in California and they grow annuals. And then they talk about letting nature into their system, but they think that nature is uh, doing a cover crop. That's not nature. It's not soil health, I don't think. It's not really about the soil health, it's about the health of the water and the air. And the only way to get the clean water is with the trees. So clean water and air comes from the trees. Yeah, your thousand acre of annuals is great, but that's not natural farming. That should be two thirds of an acre of wild space dedicated to undisturbed spaces. And when I talk about soil health, it's really about, are you growing fungi in your soil? Because if you're not, you probably, your soil health probably sucks. <clears throat> There's so many birds here. They came when we stopped. I come through here, but I take the same, this is a path, a foot, it's like a deer path that I take. And everything else is left wild. And that's why there's so many different weeds and trees that grow in it. We, yeah, we, we, we do like centropic farming, but we don't have to, we don't have to plant the trees here in Florida at this farm. They come up, they show up by their own, by themselves. We do a little chop and drop, but we don't make a habit of doing it, chopping everything down. That's not building soil. If I was to add biodynamic compost in here about 10 inches deep or five inches deep, I could grow a hellacious vegetable garden. Even over, even if the soil was compacted, that's not building soil. Annuals are easy. It's being able to grow the trees and the annuals together. That's the hard part that people just choose to ignore. The perennial systems, the natural perennial systems that we need to clean our air and water. This uh, poi muck tree is looking good. I'm going to go look at the cashew. I'm going to go look at the sugar apples because I'm sure I have to pick some so they're getting big that one up there is like it's gonna get in my belly soon so it looks like there's at least 10 fruit on here last year produced five it was don't judge the tree we've only been here six years this tree has only been in the ground five years I guess um, yeah and it was a tiny grafted tree and it's unwatered. We don't water anything here. Everything is grown naturally. We don't walk all over the soil and we apply little bits of cow manure and zebu donkey manure, zebu manure and donkey manure a day and pine shavings and grass hay with a little piss in it, whatever else comes out of them. Tiny little amounts daily, year round. Stuff's looking good. We got rain finally. Um, I'll show you where I'm putting my vegetable garden this year. 
but I grow vegetables. I'm not, not that into it. Uh, I like the fruit trees and I like the, you know, some vegetables. I like greens. Last year I spread it out all over the farm, but I realized that was like a really stupid way because I would forget where everything was. Where was that ripe lettuce? Where was that basil? Mm -hmm. And couldn't find it a lot of times. So just go and keep it in one spot <laughs> near the house. That's a good idea. That's like permaculture, right? I believe in most everything they do in permaculture. I just don't believe in driving on this soil and I don't believe in only having a um, control. So you have to like let some areas go wild. I don't believe in that aspect of it. Two thirds of the property. Our entire orchard floor is wild. 99% of the time. Just go in it to pick fruit or to plant. That's it. I take a path. These are all paths. Paths that could be mowed like the other paths. So this is where I'm going to do the vegetable garden. There's some asparagus here that, you know, I started from seed years ago. I've had vegetables here for a while. This asparagus is looking good. There's quite a bit of it. And um, there it is. It does good. You can't cut the top of it. Um, you can take some, but if you chop the whole thing down, it'll die here. So you can only take a little bit. I don't know. This they're not growing or they're not growing the organic because they don't promote the organic in the stores. They don't make the stores adhere to the same. Um, handling methods as they do the farm. The farm is so much more stringent. In the stores, they'll put the organic right in the center of all the commercial the pesticide fruit. So it's like totally stupid. And then you couldn't do that on the farm. It has to be handled separately. Can't even get near each other. So, I mean, there's just so much stuff wrong with it that is unenforced. And then they don't promote it and they don't push it. And the government doesn't back it. So... <laughs> it's like so much wrong why people aren't growing organic. It's just, ugh. and all the farmers are old because they're the ones with the land. I mean, I appreciate people growing food, but let's get real about what regenerative is. And um, it isn't 2,000 acres of annuals without a tree in, in it unless it's got some natural prairie in there. I'm talking two thirds of that. Look at this uh, Garcinia living stony eye. All those flowers. This is a male tree, so it is like, I mean, look at that. We did good. Male flowers, there they are, opened up. No fruit. This produces some fruit sometimes, not very much, like one or two. I don't know how it does it, but it does. Um, but I think I think the Garcinia living stonia fruit is so our our hermaphrodite tree. It's about this size. Produced maybe it's a little smaller. It looks a little smaller. It's right over there. Right there. It's this planted the same time as this. It produced, It's. I sold over $1,000 worth of fruit off of it, and this is why. See all that? On the hermaphrodite tree is all fruit, or would be all fruit. It's not giving me a bloom, so I imagine it could. I imagine it could have a long bloom period, uh, like the other Garcinias. It just, that tree hasn't done it yet. I gotta go over to the, uh, the cashew. Show my handiwork on chop and drop. So there's a little Ross sapote growing there in an undisturbed orchard floor. Gotta have the trees to regenerate. You gotta have the wild spaces to regenerate.
doesn't really work with your no-till system that doesn't include nature. So all these trees I look at, I, I, I look at dollar value because that one MB tree was a thousand dollars worth of fruit. And then these mangoes, these produced like 60 fruit last year. This, this one, this fruit punch mango, I like fruit punch. It has some disease issues sometimes, but I like it. I don't like it as much as sweet tart, but um, it's a healthy tree. So 60 fruit. So we sold our fruit for $10 a pound. They're big fruit. So easily they're a pound each. So um, that was what? $60? No, it's more than that. <laughs> Six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Ten times sixty. Yep, six hundred dollars. So this little tree produced six hundred dollars worth of fruit. So at maturity, this tree can produce two hundred and fifty pounds. I mean that's the standard for mangoes. Uh, say two hundred pounds. So. That's $2,000 a tree. We got 250 trees. Uh -huh. uh, even 60, $600 a tree times 200. Two, we have 250 trees, but um, probably more. I have a bunch of seedlings, but I haven't been able to add them up. That's coconut cream. This is sugar loaf. Most of them top tier mangoes. Uh, that's the best tasting mango tree we have. And that tree produced like a hundred fruit two years ago. Just a few this year. It was the cold. That's okay. I could have a day off, a, a year off. These trees here are just two years in the ground. Most of our trees are only two years old. That's what's amazing that they're so big without ever being watered. Um, especially coming off the drought. And I expect this one to... Blue, uh, bl butt out, you know, flush out. So I hacked at this pepper tree. Uh, pe pepper trees grow really well because they always show up in the areas that you don't ever visit. Uh, that's kind of the logic behind our system. Stick it where the pepper tree grows. So they grow where you don't Micromanage the, the space where you're not compacting the soil. So I chopped that back. It's on that little old watershed. This is a old well, old flow well that was capped. Uh, when you see ponds that are full, it's because old art, uh, farm wells were uh, put in to the aquifer, artesian farm wells, and they uh, rust off where there's salt intrusion on the way down to the fresh water, and then they uh, excrete salt into the, the pond. But this one was capped, thank God. And here's our well house here. Yeah, I don't really, you know, I'm not really rushing to sell this. I have to find the right person to buy it. It needs to be a family. The whole problem with the the farm is that it's just me. My partner, I don't think he's ever picked any fruit or anything. Maybe he's picked a mango for me, but he doesn't know where the fruit's at. <laughs> so it's just me 100% of the time. So it's like, uh, it needs a family. It needs somebody with kids and grandkids for sure. The young kids know how to grow. They're the ones that are putting in the food forests. It's not very many old people doing it. The old people want their lawn. This is that grass. This, this is like an aggressive grass, but because of the drought, it like had a lot of die off in it. I have a lychees in here. So yeah, I, I chopped that, that tree down, that, that uh, nitrogen-fixing tree. 
chop and drop and I'm gonna trim that pepper tree when it gets big so you know we do we do all forms of regenerative farming here but we just stay off the system I don't go in there and do it all the time <sighs> Uh, cha cha tree. It's looking quite good. It's about a foot and a half, 20 inches tall. And that's full sun. Yeah, it gets protection from the grass, but we had a horrible drought. So I normally would not, I normally would pull these pepper trees out, but this was always in the pond or like right at the edge and it was full of water moccasins. Uh, I think they've since left, but I mean, way up there, that's how low it is. It's down five feet. That's a little tiny bit of water left or in it now. It was dry. It dried completely up in the middle of the summer. So I guess it's possible here, but it didn't affect our trees. But so I have these pepper trees here. So I like to pull stuff out like this. Pull it out, even though it's probably better to leave them. It's hard to break old habits. It was really hard for me to uh, see why I want to know why and how this stuff was doing it and how it was growing so here's this big cashew tree um, that should have fruit on it right now but I don't even see any flowers because it's been drought it stopped producing when the drought started and I don't think any of the seeds I planted from it are coming up yet that's not saying they won't but usually they would be about a foot tall by now uh, but since no water, it had this pepper tree growing around it. I've chopped this pepper tree before. So I use that little saker saw on these small branches. And then I use the bigger chainsaw on that. It took me about two minutes to do all this. Um, but this needed some more sun because it was growing away from the pepper tree. That's centropic, right? But then they chop up everything. Yeah, I'm not into that. Standing over the, standing all over the soil and chopping up while you're doing it, placing it. That's just soil disturbance when it's on sand. It's a little uh, tree from last year that This is a really good crop for Florida um, and it produces a lot of fruit but this year it only produced fruit for the first couple months of summer and then it's you know late spring and then it it quit when the, it had no flowers on it which it should have flowers until August I expect it to start uh, flowering again it's pigeon pea Mm-hmm. I've got about 30 little cashews, I think, growing. I hope it's that many um, from that tree from last year. And I would be really surprised if none of the trees from this year, the seeds from this year, didn't pop up now that we're getting rain. But I'll find out. These are the little citrus trees I removed all the fruit on because the birds just really... The birds just went for our cashew and they just live back here and then they fly from these citrus trees and bite all the, you know, sharpen their beaks on this, the citrus. They only do it a certain time of year, but <clears throat> they do it enough to make damage on the, look at that, sweet tart mango. Got about 30 sweet tart mango trees. I think one of them died from the freeze. One right there. Leaves are still on it since January. Uh, that for sure is uh, getting fungi from the air. Moisture, or fungi, 
Water from the air. <laughs> Water from the air. With the help of the fungi. So I guess the rare fruit club that Vero Beach that I'm a member of, but I'm not on Facebook. They forgot to invite me. Um, they th assumed I was on Facebook, even though I had told them I don't do Facebook. To the farm next door. Uh, they've been good neighbors, but much better than the other ones. They're just normal. The other guy wasn't normal. I mean, he clear cut the whole lot and then burnt all the trees and couldn't understand why I had a problem with, with, you know, <laughs> him doing that, burning for months on end, giant trees. Oh, and shooting all the, trapping and shooting all the possums and raccoons. Killing them. Yeah, I have a problem with it. I don't have problems with the raccoons. The birds kind of are a little bit of a problem, but as the trees get bigger and I'm planting more and more cashews, well, hopefully I'll get to plant some more later this year. Um, this is another sweet tart mango. As long as, you know, more and more trees, less and less chance they will be able to eat everything. And I like the birds. And it's just, the fruit is, is uh, you know, that's a whole nother job. Collecting, <laughs> collecting and selling the fruit. <laughs> it's not my favorite job. That's why I want to sell this place. Because I don't like doing the fruit sales. And I can't stop making this bigger. It's already big, so it's like, why bother stopping now? It's, you know, it's like if I stopped planting trees now, it wouldn't. Here's my chop and drop I did with the saker saw. It's pretty good. I did this whole section all the way down the fence line in like 10 minutes. And normally it would have taken me two days with that old manual clipper. So you gotta be very careful of the blade though. So use it your own, own risk. And I noticed t if I take the battery out while I'm walking, I won't. Because if you're carrying it in your hand, it's easy to just pull the trigger inadvertently. So I take the battery out and put it in my back pocket. And the battery lasts a long time. In fact, I did all that um, chopping w without recharge, getting the second battery. So I was happy with it. This place has good wild spaces. We have so many raccoons and birds and possums. Tortoises showed up from outside the property and came into the property and now we have tortoises. I mean, it was very odd. Go for tortoises. Um, turtles, I don't know where the turtles went that were in that pond, I think maybe under the mud. I don't know. There's a big ass cha-cha tree here. She's gonna fruit. It's definitely getting big, big enough. A little bit bigger. Probably if we'd gotten a lot of rain this summer, it would have been big enough. But it's heading here now. Here's our cashews. They'd sell the achacha tree at $37 a pound and What is it? How many ounces are in? Uh, I forget. I did figured it out, but it was thousands of dollars per tree. But they take 10 years to fruit, but ours are well on their way to being 10 years old, those bigger ones. And we have fruiting a cha-cha now, so um, we're able to plant more seeds. That's the beauty of this farm is you don't have to buy any seeds now. Well, technically you do, but it's a uh, cashew from last year. Got about a hundred Luke's Garcinias. Um, so 
all various sizes, all planted at the same time, all growing naturally. Everything's grown the same way, uh, like where you would plant the pepper trees. This Luke's Garcinia, it looks like it had a little drought problem on one leaf. Um, right there, that's it. I don't see that with any of the others. Got little trees planted everywhere through here. So a little uh, achacha seedling. Okay, there's a Monstera deliciosa. The cuttings take a while. They are not very fast. Monstera deliciosa. Cashew. Cashew. What was I looking for? Oh, I was looking for that philodendron erubescence. Right here. I think it's, this is like the pink lady or pink princess. This was a cutting I did in the winter. That's why I know the cuttings in the winter. I did the, the monstera cuttings in the winter. I did two different philodendrons in the winter and some other aeroids and they all survived the drought it's, you know nothing is watered now that thing looks good it growed <clears throat> i could see where they're going to be a uh, pretty aggressive Twenty years down the road, little seedling mangoes from last year didn't grow at all this summer, but survived. And this was a compacted area. Compaction is the root of all your problems. I'm telling you, in Florida, that's what it is. Because of the mowed lawn, your soil is compacted. It's great if you want to do a market garden on top of it with compost or uh, uh, community. Uh, community compost chips, but to actually grow a tree forest in it, I think it needs to be ripped a few times or plant some bigger trees in it to break it up a little bit because it can really uh, impact the uh, growth of your tree and the health of your tree. There's a egg fruit that's, you know, a seedling egg fruit was struggling along there. The bugs like the egg fruit when the drought comes, the leaves, the grasshoppers. I'm gonna go over and look at the sugar apples. Huh. Stuff is looking good. It's amazing we have so much fruit all the time. It really is. Um, there's so many trees here though, I guess is why. People get stuck only planting one species, like a whole forest of mangoes or a whole forest of jabatacabas. But that's not what we did. We tried to plant a whole forest of everything all mixed together. Um, It's a custard apple, yeah, and then a reticulata. This is all dry farm stuff too. It's a Inga cinnamoniae. Seed grown, seed grown stuff. It's a mango, not seed grown, a grafted tree. So pigeon peas. Yeah, so I had to show the chop and drop because for some reason people act like because I do this that I don't do anything. And it's like, well, you kind of have to do stuff when you have this much crap going on. I don't know what that was. I stepped on, but it... Okay, here's the start of the pepper trees. And they go all the way down to the end of the line. It's like 300 
20 feet of sugar apples. Well, they look good. That's what I want them to look like. Green and clean. And big. I had some big ones, but I haven't had any huge ones like in years past. I think that was just a fluke, random big fruit that I got excited about and, it, and tried to hold the, uh, the, uh, the smaller fruit at the same, like I expected it all to be huge like that, that, but they're just so random. They're just not consistent, the sugar apples. And the little ones are really good. Not all little sugar apples are seedy. Ours are not seedy. Um, they're nice and chewy and good. It's the uh, Adamoya. Oh no, this is the purple chewy sugar apple that I forgot I planted and didn't realize. Because I don't mark anything. I plant and then I walk away. So I bought six seeds of the chewy purple sugar apple seeds. You know, the Isan, Pisan or whatever it is. Um, but it's a purple chewy sugar apple and two of them germinated and I planted them both out and this one I thought was an Adamoya but it turned out it was a, a chewy purple sugar apple. It was very good. Produced fruit. I got seeds from it. The seeds are very small on that that um, tree. Very small. Had a lot of seeds. Now that I think about it. I'm going to grow those seeds out and plant them. I'm going to plant a bunch more sugar apples. I mean, because look, I mean, they do so well. And $10 a pound, it's like two for two for a pound for sure. And so most of them have, I don't know, they say 10 to 20, but these have a long, they keep blooming for a long period. Even when there's ripe fruit, they can, they're still blooming. And um, sometimes. Um, so... I would say 20, 20 fruits, probably average. I know it's probably a little bit more than that. I, I need to look at my records to really figure it out. I know I've sold more than $1,000 worth of fruit. So so 20, so that's a 10, 10 pounds per fruit at $10 a pound. So that's $100 per tree per year. I'm okay with $100 per tree. Uh, and then if you sell the seeds, it, you know, it's exponentially a uh, higher number than that. But for fresh fruit, $10, I probably could have sold the fruit for more than $10 a pound. It's biodynamic certified fruit. We're biodynamic certified farm. We're going to stay biodynamic certified because I think it's important to have a level of comfort with the public when they're buying fruit. And it keeps me honest. Um, Keeps, makes me keep records because that's the difference between this and other farms is I've kept records daily notes since the day we started so yep yeah, only one percent of the money goes to research for uh, here's another custard apple a anona reticulata doing good seed seed grown here's a grafted elama tree it had that big flower on it here's another big flower but it didn't set fruit so yeah one percent of the uh, government's budget goes of the for the agriculture goes to research for organic I, I've never had any researcher or official from any of the local colleges or um, schools or anything ever reach out to me here. In fact, we did have an appointment with the uh, county government or with the Ag Extension or whatever, and they stood us up seems to be a theme. Oh. 
uh, Ilama, Steve Grant Ilama. I'm supposed to be looking at the sugar apples, but I saw that they didn't look quite ready today. And there's flowers, these little tiny flowers. These are not fruit flowers, these are just dead flowers. They have to get big. But at least it's starting up to flower again. The Atamoya, seed grown Atamoya. The Atamoya. Yeah, there's lots of fruit on these sugar apples, still. Still, still, still. There's probably 20 fruit, 10 fruit on this tree right now. Atamoyas. These, Adam these are priestly Atamoyas. They're so freaking good. I see that this fruit is going to get damaged from sitting on that branch, but I can't really do anything about it. I got a bunch of seeds off this. Look at how healthy this tree is. Bananas are looking good. I'm going to start giving all the bananas a pile of manure. They need it. I just, you know, one pile a day is all I get, so that's what I do. It's a slow, steady drip of crap and piss and pine shavings and hay. And I'm going to go in the system to do it. So I do go into the system to drop a load of crap once a year, if they're lucky. They're looking good. We got sugar apples. So if you want sugar apples, well, I guess we don't have any right now, but if you want them, get in touch with me because we're going to have them for a while. Um, this is Eric at Florida Natural Farming, Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm. I hope you have a beautiful day.